Welcome to the uh, meeting of Libertarian Alliance, which we meet every month, the uh, third Monday of the month now. Uh, tonight, uh, our speaker is uh, Robert with his talk on uh, uh, entitled Libertarianism Needs Christianity to Succeed. That's all. To you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, David. Right, well, first of all, let me thank David for inviting me and thank you for coming to this uh, event. Um, the title, as he said, is uh, Why Libertarianism Needs Christianity to Succeed. So we're here at the Libertarian Alliance. So libertarianism, as you know, is essentially even unassailably correct in saying that if its principles were adhered to, people would be, by and large, happier and wealthier. Its principles are the primacy of uh, private ownership and the non-aggression principle. However, it has a weakness. That too is unquestionable, otherwise almost everyone would be a libertarian by now, and history would be an endless series of even brighter, ever brighter sunlit uplands. We libertarians need to ask ourselves, why is this so? Why do our arguments not resonate with the wider population? My preliminary answer is because libertarianism rests on methodological individualism and subjective valuation alone. And because of that, I think a reconnection with Christianity is the only way forward for libertarianism. When I say reconnection, I mean it. Historically, Christianity arguably has been the most important factor in the creation of societies that have the highest degree of individual freedom, internal peace and prosperity. In the following hour, I want to give you what I think are the main reasons for this and consequently why libertarianism needs Christianity to succeed. I assume you've all heard of Jordan Peterson. I'm not too familiar with his 12 rules of life. However, I did listen to all his lectures on the Bible, which can be found on YouTube. They are a fascinating series of theological de depth psychology. But here's the most fascinating part for me. Yeah. Peterson yeah. offers the, up a theory as to why the Bible is essentially true. He calls it hyperreal. He says that the Bible is the result of thousands of years of debate and discussion. He says, human nature is such that we copy behavior and especially successful behavior. And the Bible is the result of a literary fixing or establishing of what constitutes not only successful individual behavior, but also successful workings of a community. And by that, he means working in a way that gives every individual a fair chance to thrive and be the best they can be, the best for themselves, but also the best for the community. If Jordan Peterson is right, and I think he is, he has managed to combine Hayek's theory of social evolution with biblical claims to truth. And that's very exciting, because one reason the Christian religion is being actively marginalized by the current ruling class in the West is that it poses a threat to their claim to power. In today's world, it is easy to dismiss Christians as scientifically ill-informed creationists and culturally backward rednecks. However, if it can be shown that the Bible itself is a product of social evolution, 
then both the humanist foundation of the current ruling class and their power-driven project of social transformation from above, both of which rest on evolutionary doctrines, are in serious trouble. So the humanist foundation would then be in serious trouble. At the heart of libertarianism lies ownership. And at the heart of ownership lies the idea of self-ownership. Everyone has the right to their property as long as it is originally acquired from an unowned nature, from unowned nature or peacefully exchanged for other goods and services. This is because we own our bodies and minds and can do with them what we like. This position in turn is derived from Mises' action axiom, or even deeper from Hopper's argumentation axiom. That, that is, you cannot deny someone else's right to their body and the products they have made with it. If you try to do this argumentatively, you are using your body to make that argument then you are implicitly saying, by making that argument, that you have the right to use your own body. If you do so, then you cannot deny this to anyone else. Although Mises and Hopper make it clear that it is undeniable that no one has more right to your body and the products made with it than you have, there is a lingering problem with this line of argument. Do we really own ourselves? Do we own ourselves in the way we own our car or our shoes or just the sticks we pick up in the garden? We mixed our labor with nature to own these things. However, we didn't mix our labor with nature to make ourselves, our bodies and minds. We simply found ourselves inside our bodies. Our parents could lay some claim on us for having made us, and in most cases nurtured us too. However, they didn't design us, and I might add, luckily, we're a bit like the previously unowned parts of nature. Our ancestors in prehistoric times acquired the lands we live in, but they didn't make them nor did they make anything in them. Nature was there already. Now, we have long gone beyond living off just the produce of the land. We have put our minds to things and created technologies with which we can live much better, longer, healthier, and more productive lives. But again, who made our minds? Who designed our bodies that our minds are used, are using, sorry, to make all these things. There are only two possibilities here. Our bodies and minds, all of nature, the whole universe was created either by random chance or purposeful action. Now, I'm not here to argue what is more likely. I suppose by now it's obvious what I believe is more likely. Instead, I want to show what implications for society each of these two positions have. The belief in random chance means that there are no ethical standards. Any ethics that are recognized under random chance are then also the result of random chance. You can argue as much as you like on the basis of the action axiom and the argumentation axiom. If everything is the result of random chance, there is ultimately nothing stopping me, ethically, from taking things from others by force. The only thing that could stop me is someone stronger than me. The belief in purposeful creation means that there must be a fixed ethic that is because where there is a purpose, there are means to achieve it. 
Either that or the purpose itself is unachievable. Under the premise of a purposeful creation, the universe must be achievable because the universe exists. If there is purpose behind creation, that means that there is an overall purpose behind everything that happens in creation, including human action. Then any means that bring us closer to the fulfillment of the overall purpose are ethical. People who believe in purposeful creation need to find out what the overall purpose is and what the means are to help achieve this purpose. However, how do we find out what the purpose is and what we should be doing to help achieve this purpose? Which brings me back to Peterson and Hayek. Peterson claims that the Bible is the result of many thousands of years of talking, thinking, and discussion about what fundamentally matters in life. For example, he believes that the creation story was orally handed down from generation to generation thousands of years before it was first written down, and that there may have been many versions of it, and that the version we see now is the one that, after much discussion, again over many generations, among many deep thinkers, was the one they concluded was indeed divinely inspired. Why? Because it resonated most deeply with most people. It meant something to them. In other words, the Bible is not is the result of human action, but not of human design. That does not mean, however, that the Bible is a random result. It re represents a deep truth precisely because it is the result of an age-old debate. Which brings me to Hayek. Hayek proposed a theory of emergent order that applies to markets as well as systems of law or any kind of human endeavor. Regarding law, he said that the case that case law will lead to an order that is the consequence of human action but not design, and that this order is superior to the alternative, which is legislation. Legislation means inventing laws and imposing them from above for the purpose of creating a supposedly better order. The problem with legislation is that there will always be competing ideas about what constitutes a better society. The legislator may claim he knows what is best for us, but there will be rival claims as to what the objective truth of the matter is. It is a problem precisely because humans are limited in their knowledge and material scarcity is an inbuilt feature of creation. So whatever that so that whatever constitutes someone's interest will almost inevitably encroach the interests of others. So, so legislation, legislation, lawmaking turns into politics, and as war is the continuation of politics with different means, it can also turn to into war. That is why Hayek proposed a return to a case law system. It does not try to anticipate beforehand everything that might happen in the future. It does not attempt perfection. It is instead applies and adapts already existing successful case law to new situations arising from new human developments, inventions, and so forth. This was the system of law making through much of the Christian-dominated Middle Ages in Europe up to the early modern era. And that time was indeed less political and internally at least more peaceful. Apart from the Crusades, wars were basically private affairs between rich people. Third parties and civilians were mostly left alone. The question is, if this system is so superior, why don't we simply return to it? There are, so, there are many reasons for this, but I think the overriding problem is the now predominant belief system. 
with which I mean the belief in purposeless evolution. People know that humans are purpose-driven. Mises' action axiom and Hopper's argumentation axioms are brilliant insights. But, taken in isolation, I suspect they are simply making conscious what most people know unconsciously, namely that action is purpose-driven. That is in no way to diminish the brilliance of Mises and Hopper. It sometimes takes a genius to make us aware of the simplest things. And their genius, of course, comprises not only these axioms, but the largely unassailable bodies of economic and constitutional insights built on these foundational axioms. The point I'm making here is based on the thinking of Gary North, and it is this. In the context of a belief in a purposeless world, humans find that they themselves are the only purpose-driven entities in the world. They therefore believe that they alone, without any recourse to a higher institution, can make the world a better place. Or even have to. That's the whole point about these axioms. We act to improve our situation in the world. Not only that, we then also believe that we are the only entities who can decide what constitutes a better world. And it's exactly at this point where Hayek's theory of emergent order runs into trouble. Like all libertarians, he believes in subjective valuation. And he has a point. We cannot decide for other people, at least for other adults, what is good for them. Ultimately, everyone needs to decide that for themselves. But in the context of a purposeless world, plus the insight that we are all limited in knowledge and reach, this leads to one of two reactions. Either to a fear-driven scramble for power, or a fear-driven disengagement from society. The scramble for power, because if I'm not in power, others will be, and dictate their preferences upon me. The disengagement or withdrawal from society in case of those who, for whatever reason, do not want to participate in this scramble for power. Neither of these reactions are a long-term solution for libertarianism. The scramble for power, obviously not, because that leads to tyranny. However, the simple flight from power is also bound to fail to bring about a libertarian world. Why this is so, I will now explain in some detail. After that, I will return to the idea that the Bible can be seen as a quasi Hayekian result of human action, but not design. That is to say, not human design. For the following, I lean heavily on the work of Gary North. North is an Austrian school economic historian, but he is also a reformed Protestant, um, a Protestant theologian. He has written, among many other things, a 31 volume complete economic commentary of the Bible. He, critic, he criticizes the methodologies of both individualism and collectivism. I'll say that again. He criticizes the methodologies of both individualism and collectivism as insufficient. He bases his ideas on his own, a third methodology, which he calls methodological covenantalism from the covenant of God with his people. On that basis he posits a third solution apart from power and flight. He calls it dominionism. He posits three basic religions that are all pervasive throughout history and all societies. Namely power religion, dominion religion, and escapist religion. 
I will now explain these three religions in detail. Here's North's definition of power religion. This religious viewpoint, so quote, this religious viewpoint affirms that the most important goal for a man, group, or species is the capture and maintenance of power. Power is seen as the chief attribute of God, or if the religion is officially atheistic, then the chief attribute of man. This perspective is a satanic perversion of God's command to man to exercise dominion over all creation. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Power religion is the attempt to exercise dominion apart from covenantal subordination to the true creator God, end quote. The archetypal biblical representation of power religion is the Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Throughout history and to this very day, there are very many who have tried to emulate Pharaoh by adhering to power religion. So what about dominion religion? North defines it as the religion that, quote, proclaims the sovereignty of God, the reliability of the historic creeds, the necessity of standing up for principle, and the requirement that faithful men take risks for God's sake, end quote. It also, North continues, quote, it is also, quote, a religion of conquest, conquest by grace through ethical action. The goal is ethical conformity to God, but the results of this conformity involve dominion over lawful subordinates, over ethical rebels, and over nature, end quote. It is important to emphasize at this point the meaning of conquest under dominion religion. It is the conquest not by the initiation of violence, not by the forceful <coughs> suppression of opinion, not by arbitrary laws, not by fraud. All that would be an expression of power religion. Under dominion religion, conquest happens by grace and ethical action, meaning by convincing non-believers with words and example. This can only work if words and actions coincide, that is, if there is integrity. This, in turn, can only work by establishing a general culture which creates them a norm where words and action are principled, not arbitrary. And this, in turn, only works if there is an institution that people in general believe in, above and beyond even the richest, most powerful person, i.e. beyond the realm of humanity. And that institution is God the Creator, i.e. the ultimate owner of the world and everything in it, and God the ultimate judge of his creatures, in particular those he created in his image. With regards to the third basic religion, escapist religion, North says that, quote, Proponents of escapist religion have sought to insulate themselves from the general culture, a culture min maintained by power, end quote. So escapist religionists do realize, or at least sense, that there is something deeply wrong, um, there's something deeply wrong or dangerous about trying to exercise power over other people so they keep their distance. Or if they can't keep their distance, they disassociate themselves as much as possible from the exercise of power. However, they also do not want to associate themselves with dominion religion. North says, quote, they have fled the responsibilities of worldwide dominion or even regional dominion in the vain hope that God will release them from the requirements of the general dominion covenant, end quote. The general dominion covenant is based on God's first commandment spoken to humans, according to the Bible. Quote, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. End quote. That's Genesis 1, 28. Adherents of escapist religion don't want power, but neither do they accept the responsibility that comes with accepting the commandment of governing the earth. Instead, the escapist religionist 
focuses his ethical concern on ever narrower areas of personal responsibility. Quote from Gary North, his concern is his is sorry, his concern is self from start to finish. His attempt to escape from responsibilities beyond the narrow confines of self is a program for gaining power over self. It is a religion of works of self-salvation. A man first humbles himself by admitting that there are limits to his power. He then insists that there are major limits to the range of his responsibilities. He does this in order to elevate himself to a position of hypothetically godlike spirituality, a being unconcerned with dominion or power." End quote. As examples of escapist religion, North points to Buddhism and what he calls pietistic Christianity. By the latter, he means Christians who worship God, tithe, help their family and church members and neighbors. They may try to convert other people, but they do not see it as their task to change society and institutions in general towards being more Christian. The most, they mostly go along with whatever state power tells them to do, with barely a murmur of protest. Sometimes they even enthusiastically embrace the latest quasi-religious fads, for example climate change, blind for the possibility that it is one more thing with which the state wants to enslave us. North says that power and dominion religion are in a cosmic struggle with each other. Escapist religion, however, is, quote, standing on the sidelines, waiting to see the outcome of the clash, end quote. But not forever, North says. They end up joining the winning side, or what they perceive to be the currently winning side. Now, what has all this to do with libertarianism? And what does it have to do with the title of my speech? Why libertarianism needs Christianity to succeed? Well, when I first read that description of escapist religion, you know, people who don't want to exercise power for power's sake, who sense the wrongness of it, and who see no other way out of this wrongness than for every human to seek only power over themselves, and therefore more or less abandoning the world, who, on the other hand, don't want to exercise dominion under the rules of a creator God as revealed in the Bible, you know, I'm a libertarian, and this does sound a lot like libertarianism. We libertarians know how terrible the world of politics is, and how one government intervention leads to unintended consequences, how these unintended consequences are then taken by politicians and their cheerleaders in the media as a welcome reason for further interventions, until it all ends in a totalitarian disaster. And then, and we then ask ourselves, what can we do about this? And essentially, there are two answers I can see that libertarians give. Either A, educate people until they vote the nasty people out and instead vote for a radical shrinking of the state. Or B, private cities, or seasteading, or let's all go and take over New Hampshire, and so forth. I call the latter answer the Galtz, Galt, Galtz Gulch solution. Both of these answers are based on escapist religion. The second one is more obviously such a thing. It is an institutionalized, it's sorry, it is an institutionalized form of escapism. The world is rotten, so let's get out. Maybe some who think along these lines hope that the economic success of such gulches will inspire others, until we have a world covered by thousands of Liechtensteins. It is, I think, a vain hope. But the former educational strategy is also a version of escapist religion, because in both cases it is because we do not offer a purpose beyond individual freedom. We have learned from Mises that humans act purposefully, but we libertarians do not offer a purpose beyond each and everyone's subjective goals. All we have is the promise that 
If we organize our societies along libertarian principles, i.e. along the non-aggression principle, then wealth will grow and there will actually be less inequality, but of course not total equality, and we'll all be rather happier. It is, to be sure, a very well-founded promise. We can prove it theoretically, but there is a fundamental problem with this promise. We promise efficiency based on subjective valuation, but not morality. I'll come to the non-aggression pact in, uh, principle in, uh, in a minute. So that's a Freudian slip there. Um, ours is a purely materialistic promise. And I think that is nowhere near enough to induce people to follow us. In general, people follow something or someone they can believe in. Sure, they want to lead a comfortable life, but they want not only material gains, they also want meaning and justice. They want their lives to be at least guided by morality. And by the way, I'm sure that is why Jordan Peterson resonates so well. He has discovered that people are thirsting for meaning in their lives. Not so much happiness, but meaning. And he explains how they can find it. And the fascinating thing is that he, a secular social scientist, uses the Bible to show people how they can find meaning. And meaning must be based on morality, otherwise it is just meaningless vandalism. However, we libertarians simply tell people that a libertarian order is likely to bring about society richer and happier than now. But that argument, even if it is believed, is not enough. What if, in a, in a libertarian society, there is some rich guy who can afford everything and there are still people dying faultlessly of hunger or some preventable disease? Where's the justice in that? Libertarians answer with the non-aggression principle. We should not be forced to be charitable. That's all well and good, most people will say. But what if the voluntary charity is not enough, if poor people are still dying needlessly? The problem that arises here for libertarians is that there is more than just a subjective valuation. There is also an objective reality, and methodological individualism cannot take account of that. We say, if someone wants to buy a large pleasure yacht, it is his own money, with, sorry, with his own money, instead of donating at least some of it to the absolute poor and buy a smaller yacht instead, that's okay by us. We should not force him. However, the objective reality of people dying needlessly will condemn us. The methodological holists or collectivists claim to know the objective necessities in a society. They'll say, let's tax the rich man and give to the destitute, open bracket, after taking our own cut as we deserve to be rewarded to, for being such good people, end, end bracket. The rich man can then still buy a smaller yacht and more people survive. The problem that any methodological collectivist has is that this claim to know what the objective necessities are will always fail in reality, at least in the long run, or in large communities, because everyone's individual knowledge is limited, even theirs. That's why socialism always fails. However, Here's the nub of the problem for libertarianism, or libertarians. Collectivists invoke morality. Individualists don't. Collectivists claim to want to help the poor or to want to right a wrong. Individualists simply say, we shouldn't be forced to help the poor, we shouldn't be forced to right a wrong. We have very good reasons for this stance, however, is it then much of a surprise that if those are the only two choices, most people opt for forced charity and inaccurate justice 
rather than the possibility of insufficient charity and no justice? I think not. Apart from the question of morality and justice, there is the materialism. I think that most people sense that a purely materialistic promise, if, even if well-founded, is something not worth believing in. And that's the key word here, belief. No amount of libertarian education can eliminate a deeply rooted belief. If we, it can only be fought effectively with the help of a rival belief, one that is at least as well-founded as the other. What do those who hesitate or refuse to get on board with libertarianism believe in? I don't mean our ideological adversaries, not the socialists, the statists, the collectivists. They believe in power. I mean, I mean our neighbours, colleagues, friends, family members, nice, decent, down-to-earth, common-sense sort of people. Why do they reject libertarianism? You've probably all had these conversations with some of them. They agree with lots we say. Too much government intervention. Too much incompetent meddling. Too much waste. However, inevitably, these questions come up. If there's no state, or even just a radically shrunken state, who's going to build the roads? Who's going to take care of the sick and elderly? Who's going to educate the children? And so on. We have all tried to explain but it's to no avail. The reason is their belief, their faith. They are, like us libertarians, to a large extent adherents of the escapist religion. But the difference between them and the libertarians is that they don't stand on the sidelines anymore. As North predicts, adherents of escapist religion usually end up following the one of the two other religions currently winning. And the currently winning religion is obviously power religion. Our neighbours, colleagues and friends don't think that they as individuals are masters of their own fate, as some libertarians do. Instead, they have conceded that power religion has won without ever phrasing it that way, without ever even thinking about it, but essentially that is what they do. They therefore, deep down, believe not in salvation through the individual, but in salvation through politics, salvation through the state. They essentially believe that the modern bureaucratic and overbearing state with some kind of pharaoh at the top or a bunch of competing wannabe pharaohs will sort out any problems they don't feel they can sort out themselves, or at least that they should. They appeal to the state to save them. That's why, for example, barely a generation after the fall of the Berlin Wall, an involvement of communists in a German government has become conceivable again. And also an involvement of communists in the British government. What do we libertarians offer our neighbours, colleagues and friends instead? A belief in themselves. Why is it not good enough? Why is this not sufficient to draw them away from a certain path towards totalitarianism? Because, deep down, they know two things about themselves. One is, they know they are limited in time and knowledge. Something will one day be stronger and cleverer than them and put an end to their physical existence. They will die. The other thing they know about themselves is, they know they are faulty, even with the best of knowledge they get things wrong from time to time. If they ever read Atlas Shrugged and were confronted with the question, who is John Galt? They know one thing for sure. They themselves certainly ain't John Galt. <laughs> None of us is, by the way, just in case you were wondering. So they are not going to join Galt's Gulch. 
and no amount of libertarian education will budge them because they know deep down that they are, and here I you offer another word for faulty, they know they are sinners. They often miss the mark. That's the original meaning of sinning. They get things wrong, either through ineptitude or maliciousness, or they are at least tempted to. And what's more, if they know that if they get things wrong or at least tempted to get things wrong, others, including their neighbors, will also get things wrong from time to time. And they want some court of appeal if and when that happens. They want something, some objective thing that keeps them and their neighbors in line, at least most of the time. And they want some standard by which this court of appeal is reliably run. In other words, they feel they need outside guidance and correction. That means standards and laws. And if the churches are not offering that, and if the libertarians are not offering that, these people will go elsewhere. And if people don't believe in the Creator God, who has given us the command to govern the world, to exercise dominion according to his laws, there is only one other place to go, and that is to follow the power religion and to bow to the state, even as it becomes more and more absolute or totalitarian. So if we observe the plight of libertarianism from a theological viewpoint, there is only one conclusion possible. In order to succeed, Libertarianism must want dominion religion to succeed. Now, obviously, that would mean a return to a belief in a purpose-driven world, meaning a purpose-driven creation, or, if you feel squeamish about that word, a purpose-driven evolution. Of course, it's obvious to me that there is reluctance among at least some libertarians to even consider this as a viable strategy. To counter that, I could point to history and show how Christianity is, mo is likely to be the most important factor in the establishment of a relatively relative freedom and prosperity we enjoy in the West. But I won't do that today. Instead, I will continue with showing how the Bible can be considered as true under quasi hayekian perspective of spontaneous order with a certain caveat. I had said earlier that Hayek's system of spontaneous order as a foundation for freedom runs into trouble when we believe in a purposeless world. In such a world, spontaneous order will lead either to a fear-driven scramble for power or a fear-driven flight from society. And in the long run, the power-driven will catch up with the escapists. However, it is quite a different story if Hayek's spontaneous order is combined with a belief in a purpose-driven world. What happens then is that we can then apply the case law system, which Hayek claims to be superior, and use it to help us discover the exact nature of that purpose we believe exists. In fact, if you look at Exodus, I am convinced this is exactly what happened prior to the revelation of the Ten Commandments. The revelation of the Ten Commandments is described in chapter 20. Chapter 19 is the preparation of this, where God tells Moses that the Hebrews will be his chosen people and that they should therefore keep themselves holy. Chapter 18 is the interesting one in my context. Here, after the flight from Egypt, Moses is described sitting in judgment over all the cases the people bring to him. And Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, tells him, this quote is from the NLT version of the Bible, quote, this is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed, you're going to wear yourself out and the people too. 
This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. End quote. He gives Moses this advice. Quote, Select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 150, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes. But have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, make the task easier for you. End quote. This is verses 18 to 22 in chapter 18. And that's what Moses does, according to Exodus. Now, to me, this sounds very much like the process Hopper describes in his book, Democracy, the God that Failed. The process which ends in what Hopper calls the natural order. People will naturally ask judicial advice of those in their community who have a proven track record of being reliable, considerate, even-handed, honorable, and successful in their lives. In other words, natural leaders. And if, the, if these chosen judges can't find a solution, they will take it to the next level. The difference is that in the Bible, Moses is said to have appointed these people thus from above. However, I believe that someone as wise as Moses would not just appoint anyone as a judge over a community of 10, 50, and so on. Um, that as judges that these communities would not accept. It wouldn't be in his interest to do so because he wants to offload some work, not increase it for himself. So, I think that in Exodus chapter 18, we have an early and biblical example of Hopper's natural order. And I am certain that it is no coincidence that this chapter comes almost immediately before the revelation of the Ten Commandments. I'm convinced that they are the culmination, the end result of a multitude of case-by-case -case law discovery leading to a spontaneous order. However, and here's the very important difference to pure Hayek, the caveat, it is spontaneous, but it is not arbitrary. I predict that any such process in any covenantal community would end up with an identical set of commandments. And that is good because even Hopper, who claims to be agnostic, has recently said that the Ten Commandments are a very libertarian set of rules. He is a bit circumspect about the first four, Commandments, which are mainly about the proper acknowledgement of God, the, and the fourth uh, is about keeping the Sabbath holy, but he is quite clear about the other six. They are, very briefly and, and shortened, uh, five, honor your father and mother, six, you shall not murder, seven, you shall not commit adultery, eight, you shall not steal, nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not cut desires neighbor, your neighbor's house, etc., etc. None of this you, know, you should desire, and anything that is your neighbor's. Hopper says that these six commandments, of these six commandments, that they, quote, can be recognized as even an improvement over a strict and rigid libertarianism, given the common shared goal of social perfection, of a stable, just, and peaceful social order, end quote. In other words, given a purpose, a purpose that can be found if one looks for it. So why do I, why do I think that the case law process I just described would result in an identical set of commandments in any covenantal society? It is because I believe the world was purposefully made, that the laws of nature were made to hold it together physically, to give it a physical longevity and predictability, and that the ethical laws were made at the same time to make the world ethically predictable and give societies longevity and stability. That means 
It was done in order to allow us, the image of the Creator, to prosper if we live by the Creator's natural and ethical laws. And they were there from the beginning and needed to be discovered um, in order for us to prosper in this world. If we try to live in ignorance of the laws of nature, we die very quickly. If we try to live in ignorance of the laws of ethics, there is tyranny and or carnage and destitution. I believe this is so because we observe that any chaotic system turns quickly into some kind of order when there are so-called attractors present. For example, chaotically dispersed water vapor becomes a rain cloud if there are little dust particles present upon which the H2O molecules condense and turn into ever larger water droplets until gravity overcome, <coughs> overcomes the air resistance and pulls them to the ground. The droplets represent a higher level of order than the completely random distribution of the molecules and the dust particles are the attractors that make the droplets possible. How does this natural example translate into the development of a system of law? The world we found ourselves in, in prehistoric times, appeared to us as an arbitrary, often chaotic and very fearful place. And that includes other people. They can be very fear-inducing. To the extent that we have discovered the laws of nature and the laws of ethics and lived by them, we have been able to reduce the level of arbitrariness and chaos in our lives. That is because these laws were pre-existing attractors in a world that initially seemed very chaotic. And over the course of centuries and millennia, we, or rather the Hebrews, discovered the laws that bring peace and prosperity to a community without the need of a strong central power. An individual would never be able to work this out for himself. This is the lesson from Jordan Peterson's Bible lectures. It could only come about through constant attempts to find modes of behavior towards others that in the course of our daily lives lead to a result that reliably improves the lives of everyone. And the Hebrews were the first to discover this set of rules and were most conducive, that, sorry, that were most conducive to improvement. And they did so because they had the right mindset to make that kind of discovery. They had the belief that made it possible. In detail, they had the belief in a creator who was outside space and time. That's already a fundamental difference to all other religions at the time. The gods of, of the others were part of creation, which spontaneously arose from chaos. The Hebrews also believed in a, definitive, sorry, a definite beginning and a definite end of time, a linear view of time. Thank you. Again, a fundamental difference to all the other religions. The others all had a circular view of time, or one without beginning or end. A limited, linear time view led to the idea that progress is possible. And lo and behold, progress was possible. The Hebrews were led out of slavery into the promised land. At least that is the story they told themselves. And that is what counts, because it helped shape the idea of progress ever since. So when they discovered their laws, the laws of God, they wrote them down as something holy. And I believe they were right. And very near the end of the five books of Moses, the so-called Pentateuch, as a kind of culmination of the system of laws, we have a final promise and warning. In Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the curses. God promises very detailed blessings, what we now would call per capita economic growth, on the nation of Israel, 
as long as they obey his rules, and he promises curses, either natural disasters or plagues or disastrous wars, when his rules are not obeyed. This principle of blessings and curses was not discarded by Jesus. Instead, he reiterated it, for example, in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Three servants are given some talents, i.e. valuable coins. Two of them invest the talents successfully and are blessed by the master. The third one just buries the talent. The master curses him and orders him to be thrown out into the outer darkness, quote, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, end quote. So, ownership coming from God is secure if people believe in him as creator of the world and that his rules will lead to blessings, i.e. prosperity, if adhered to. The alternative to that is an arbitrary universe in which peace and prosperity is a chance lull in a never-ending chaotic whirl of power grabs. Conclusion. Without God, libertarianism is doomed to be a fringe element of society, impotently watching as tyrannies rise and fall into chaos and rise again in an apparent endless series. On its own, libertarianism will never achieve its goals of freedom, prosperity, and happiness for the greatest number of people. The reason is that libertarianism disregards meaning and objective values. It doesn't invoke morality. It has become dislocated from its spiritual parent, which is Christianity born of Judaism. This is the dominion religion which commands us to govern the world, but to do so by adhering to the ultimate owner's laws. Like the Hebrews in Egypt, we can reach the promised land, the sunlit uplands, or we can remain slaves. That is the choice we are given. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Any questions? Any questions? Contributions? I don't know how to make one from the chair to begin with, anyway. Uh, isn't uh, liberalism itself a moral doctrine? Uh, of course, it's not the non aggression principle that you talked about, is it? Not only. Uh, it's uh, mainly respecting the equal liberty of everyone else. And this is, of course, a moral mm. uh, idea. Now, as Janice pointed out in his book, uh, he, uh, he, it doesn't have to. You, you, uh, uh, a sceptic can uh, criticise it, just like any moral theory can be criticised by a sceptic. So you don't have to hold the liberal position in order to criticise the liberal position. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can take, uh, you, uh, you, you can criticise uh, an ethical theory objectively, uh, but it's nevertheless still a uh, moralistic uh, theorem. Now, Plato did hold that, uh, Nietzsche said that uh, Christianity is, uh, is uh, Plato, for the ma uh, Plato for the masses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, uh, he might be right there. He's one of his better than it all. But uh, Plato did hold that the world of forms beyond you know, uh, the uh, apparent world. What he meant is that for once we start thinking, we do actually see general truths, you mm -hmm. know, men, you know, difference between men and women, or the difference between day and night and so on. Now you could make out a case, and indeed I made out a case about 20 years ago at the Carl Buckler Conference, uh, that in fact the domain of ethics mm -hmm. is in this, what Papa called the third realm, is in this, uh, in fact I'd now say it's in the uh, the, end, the the the, uh, the north, realm of north, but it's in the thing. It's it's in, it's in for once we start for once an intelligent person, a cat, for example, hasn't got a big enough brain to think morally, whereas even a stupid man does have enough mm -hmm. brain power to think morally, and mm -hmm. any man, no matter how silly he is, will have a, a, a something. Good. I mean, you said in this inquiry concerning uh, principles and morals. Amorality is a myth. 
all humans are moral to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I must say, Darwin doesn't say that natural selection is purposeless. Of course, animals have purpose. All animals have purpose, the purpose to eat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Dawkins keeps yes. coming out with this, natural selection is not purposelessness. This is just a, a myth about Darwin that Richard Dawkins keeps okay. on addressing. Well, um, um, animals have no purpose beyond survival, uh, whereas humans have the purpose to improve their, their situation um, beyond survival. They want to create a, a, a better situation for themselves. They want to improve it constantly. That's one thing. And the aspect of moral, yeah, is I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that everyone understands morals, but um, they have not necessarily a reason to keep to them, to adhere to them. Um, and that is what I pointed out with the difference of power religion and dominion religion. Um, um, if you don't believe in a power beyond human realm that um, has set the laws equal to for everyone, the rich and the poor, the powerful and the powerless, yeah, then the powerful have no reason to use the power as they will and as they feel. So you feel. don't think there's such a thing as a categorical imperative? Well, there might be, but it's, it, it, it's, it's simply words. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what, well, and, a lot of people, I mean, most people would agree with you. Yeah? There are two people who, <coughs> in the past, in a way distant past, who would not have agreed with that. And, then, and actually there's two people in this room who wouldn't agree with you as well. Right. Uh, but the two people in the distant past are Socrates and Plato. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. thought that uh, you cannot willingly do wrong. Uh, now, most people, in other words, they thought sin was absurd. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so you know, they thought that if you think that something's right, then you must, uh, you must uh, uh, adhere to it. In other words, there's a categorical mm. imperative. Now, of course, uh, my lecturer at what university used to always throw cold water over the categorical imperative. The categories are just empty. He kept saying over and over again, and most people think that. However. Uh, Kant didn't think it, mm. uh, but I'm, I'm not referring to Kant. I'm talking to the other two people who are both far superior to Kant, in my opinion, Socrates and, and Plato, and they uh, oh, they uh, thought of the Catholic said, No man willingly does bad actions. That's right. That's different, though, than, than your formulation. It really means that he, he, that he doesn't know what he's doing. He does something. Which, which may be his later self when he's better informed about the common good yes. and even the idea of the common good, he's blanket. In other words, if, if you know the category, you know the imperative. If you don't know the category, you don't know the imperative. Uh, it's, a, sorry, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tautology, really. really in the well, sense, you say it's it's like saying people just do the best they can at the time. Mm. That'd be a good reason. Yeah. And, and the... What I was trying to say was, with the Hayekian way of ha having f already found, or claimed to have already found, an order that creates, uh, or helps to create more prosperity, peace, etc., um, it then does become a sin, in the sense of missing the mark, to not add to, uh, well, consciously not to adhere to it, um, after having been taught it. Yeah. Well, that's a kid, you know, because you brought up Young and, and you're talking about Jordan Peterson. One thing yeah. Jordan Peterson said, what's interesting about human beings is they knowingly do things which they know they shouldn't do. Yeah. Because as you know, well, you thought, that, I'm, well, I'm afraid I have a very opinion no, of Peterson. No, no, He's no, thick. No, no, thick. Don't don't to you Bible don't like him. I think he's stupid. Bible, <laughs> we, we contain multitudes that there's inner forces within ourselves which are in competition mm. with themselves. I do yeah. Like yeah. I do like him. You do like him, okay. But I think he's but, stupid. All right. <laughs> well, I won't comment. <laughs> so, sorry, well, Mr. Sorry. 
Yes, uh, yeah, thank you for, for the discussion. Very interesting, very interesting mm -hmm. talk there, actually. It you know, got me thinking mm -hmm. about a lot of things were going back, way back in history there. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we uh, debated that kind of stuff. Um, but what you said mm -hmm. would apply not just to Christianity. I mean, Christianity is a kaleidoscope mm -hmm. of, um, of religions, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, to take for uh, John Calvin, and his uh, theory of predest predestination, mm. where uh, many souls, in, in fact, the vast majority of souls, they're already condemned to hell. Mm. They can't possibly save themselves, whatever they do. Yeah. Um, so uh, you, um, it wouldn't really apply. It's not necessarily a bad thing, you mean, in your in your little scheme of, of, of thinking. Mm. Uh, and I'll tell you why very very quickly. But one of the problems with Sorry, I already just, just jumped into something else quickly. It will also apply to a lot of other religions. Mm. I mean, Islam, Buddhism, I mean, there's, there's more than 4,000 official religions in mm. Britain, mm. Um, and more than 40,000 in the world, uh, 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 official and unofficial. Uh, and, and most of them have got a similar theme. Mm. Uh, most of them, they, 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 they go around the, the idea of, you know, the, uh, the Wizard of Oz, Wizards, Wizards of Oz, man working the machinery behind the scenes and mm. some little book or something he's come out with and mm. if you follow him you know you'll be all right if you don't then mm. you get the stick and, mm. and, you know, mm. carrot and stick and that kind mm. of thing most of them are along those lines yeah the problem is in, in a nutshell with the advancement of technology for example to just give you one simple example mm. um the advancement of technology of nuclear technology uh, and nuclear weapons especially uh, you would have a situation of mad, mutually assured destruction, mm. and, that, and that would keep a balance. Mm. When you have the, uh, these kind of things taking over, you know, these, I, I would call it, for want of a better word, word I would call it these, these kind of mad texts, mm. in a way, taking over, that goes out the window. You haven't got that mad balance anymore, because um, I'm sorry, I don't got, follow. What, what goes out of the window now? Uh, the, 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 what, what goes out the window is, is the idea of reason, of rationality. Oh, right. Okay. Because mm. if, in, in most cases, if you think there's some kind of heaven mm -hmm. which you're going to go to, then, it, then the idea of mutually assured destruction doesn't matter, does it? Because you'll be up there with your 78 mm. uh, virgins or whatever the Christian mm. equivalent is, mm. you, you'll be living uh, So the idea of rationality goes out the window. I mean, that's a simple example. It doesn't apply in all, in all examples. For example, John Calvin's predestination, yep. when you're already condemned, so you're not going up there anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but it could apply not just to Christianity. This is the dangerous thing about mm. what you're saying. Mm. It could apply to any of the many, many thousands of these a lot of them, let's be honest, lunatic religious mm. beliefs. Mm. Um, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not convinced about what you said about the more people that follow a particular religion, then the more right or true it's going to be. I, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say uh, that. Well, 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 I think, I mean, in yeah. a nutshell, I think mm. there was something you, you, you did imply that mm. that was the case. Um, I, 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 I think that was uh, certainly isn't the case, but ultimate truth. Mm. I mean, certainly not in a scientific sense. Mm. Uh, that's why most religions, I mean, if you look at what most religions have, have actually um, condemned people who have come out with scientific truth mm. uh, rather than the, the opposite. Uh, but but, uh, but anyway, the, the, my main point is this: that you can say that about almost any religions because because they they, they cover a kaleidoscope of, uh, mm. of beliefs. Um, Christianity, for example, would have literally hundreds, mm. hundreds of, of, of kind of uh, belief systems, mm. and so would most of the other uh, four thousand official religions in the country. Um, uh, uh, that, that's the thing. I mean, now, Pin it down to one religion. Um, well, to answer properly, I would have to have another lecture, really. Um, but uh, I'll try to be very brief. Um, uh, 
I did indicate in the talk that so there are there are very good reasons for thinking that um, it was in the West that the Industrial Revolution happened and the Scientific Revolution before that, um, and and that uh, the main if maybe even the main reason is Christianity. I recommend instead of giving you another lecture, I recommend um, at least two books. One is by Rodney Stark, calling oh. called the Victory of Reason, yeah. and the other is by an Indian Protestant uh, called Vishal Mangalvadi, called um, the Book That Changed Your World. Yeah? And and uh, many details and many examples there show why how Christianity shaped the West and and how important that was. And how Christianity shaped uh, and, and brought around, brought about scientific thinking in the modern sense that Greeks had some bits right, but not sufficiently right, and uh, it was necessary for various parts, including the linear linear time um, uh, view that I mentioned, yeah, or, or the idea that progress is not only possible, that it is happening in some way or another, and that you have to adhere to uh, um, God's laws, to, or you have to find them out to be successful. Yeah? And so you have to find them out, and you have to, have to, to search for them. Yeah? So that is why uh, science arose <coughs> in the Christian West. Um, and so, yes, it is... And I understand the danger of saying we're right, you're wrong. Yeah, and so. <clears throat> um, danger. Um, no, no, from a religious, the religious um, a position of saying I'm right, you're wrong. You have to. And that's why uh, I quite is like. That dangerous? Them. Is that dangerous anyway? Well, if you. Isn't it harmless to if, say? if that is then combined with power religion, it becomes dangerous. It, uh, yeah, then, then it, it becomes um, tyrannical, and that is why I very I like the idea of Gary North of the dominion you mean if religion. We sense a heresy. If we sense a heresy, that's dangerous. We sense that any heresy, we won't allow and, it. We're not tolerant of any criticism. No, no, no. no. Uh, uh, criticism should be allowed and oh, is allowed, yeah. of course, and, and, should, and should always be allowed. <clears throat> Otherwise, well, how should we ever find and, and, and improve on mm. our knowledge and and and, free, and 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 yeah? But you're saying it's dangerous if we if we do have no tolerance. Yes. Yes. I agree. Exactly. Sorry. Yes. Um, and and that is why I like what Gary North said about um, dominion religion of. Um, um, uh, of, of convincing by grace and and um, uh, convincing with uh, um, a good um, example and um, and words and not by force and arbitrary uh, um, you know, enforcement of, of some laws that some people don't believe in or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what was those two books you mentioned? Oh yeah, uh, Rodney Stark. He's a Catholic. That's why I mentioned him. Uh, and then uh, the other one is Protestant. Rodney Stark, The Victory of Reason, and the other, um, Vishal with a V, V-I-S-H-A-L, Mangalvadi, uh, M-A-L, M sorry, M-A-N-G-A-L, V-A-D-I. I, I think Mangalvadi, <laughs> uh, and at least the book is called "The Book That Changed Your World." It's an interesting title, meaning the Bible, and he's an Indian, and he's talking to the West. Your world, yes. yeah. Very interesting book. Anyone else to say? Janice left the room suddenly. Uh, well, I wonder if I can. Oh, no. Is there anyone else? Because uh, I'm, I'm fully aware that I shouldn't have said as much as I've said to the chair. Or anybody else said it because no one else was saying anything. Uh, you know, I, I, I would, you know, um, there was a fellow called John Ferguson who uh, 
died around about 1975 or so. But before he died, he was the Dean of the Open University and he was also the Dean of the Salio Colleges in, in Birmingham. And he made a startling statement, which I found myself agreeing with automatically. Mm -hmm. He says, England has never been a Christian country. Mm -hmm. He was a Quaker, Society mm -hmm. of Friends, which is an extreme Puritan group following Fox in the Civil War. Um, and uh, bear in mind when you look at people like Chaucer, which is one of the old English... The, the people there don't act as though they're Christian at all. Although they're pilgrims going to Canterbury Tales, they don't act as though they're Christians at all. They act just as secular as anyone in today's world. And what we've had is that Christians have a bent. I don't know, if we, it must be something in the tree, but I haven't been able to pinpoint whereabouts in the tree it is, for exaggerating the influence of Christianity on everyday life. Mm. What, what we get is uh, an ordinary person uh, who, who's... Uh, hasn't really picked up much of the religious instruction, nevertheless superimposes that what we might call, what the, well, I suppose the socialists would call, what the Marx would call, bourgeois mm. morals, is in fact the morals of Christianity. But if you actually take bourgeois morals, we know what they are, you almost outlined them in, in the last part of the, uh, the, the Six uh, Commandments. Mm. Uh, uh, if we contrast those with even the Gospels, if I, if I uh, write I offend thee, pluck it out. Mm. Uh, uh, I come to you, know, let the dead bury the dead. Uh, you know, it, the, the, whole, the whole thing is, of the whole Christian creed is of a, a final days, a future. There is no future. There, there is no need for mor morals. Christianity itself is amoral. Never mind about this world. This world's had it. Mm -hmm. So w what you get is, you get a bourgeois morality that we all know. Mm. And this is attributed wrongly to the Christian, to both the Old Testament and New Testament. In the in the in the uh, uh, Old Testament, we get uh, uh, men using uh, uh, both sides of the family to compete with each other. Uh, uh, Jacob, I think his name is uh, uh, Isaac's uh, sons. They use their their uh, the, 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 there is uh, 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 I forget these ladies' names, but. Uh, uh, but you know they're having competition for for children on each side of the family, mm. uh, and and uh, these aren't these aren't uh, these aren't families which are respecting these six wars. The, the Old Testament ignores them. The New Testament says we're in the final days. Don't worry about them. No, no. <laughs> okay. Again, that will be another uh, lecture. Um, uh, the, the the examples from the Old Testament that don't adhere to the commandments were from before. That was from Genesis. Yeah commandments came a bit later um, but there you can see a, a, a development towards it already there um, the end days um, let's say um, the ideology within um, or the, the end days coming soon ideology within Christianity um, results from the time before um, the fall of, of Jerusalem in year 70 AD when people and 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 you can you, if you look at what Jesus says about it's coming soon kind of thing you can always see that he he meant the fall of Jerusalem not the end of the world however there were there was a time in early times where people said it's the end of the world or they, that is coming and therefore we will now all share our but does it mean things. the second coming is coming within the, um, the second it's the second coming which is it may not be the end of will, the world yes the, it's, that the is, end, it's the yes. end of the world as we know it isn't it yes so the, the second coming is still part of orthodox christian theology only we don't know when it will come now, here's, here um, is something that I've also learned from Gary North, is that there are these different, uh, very different interpretations of the end days um, and the so-called millennium. And that has an impact, again, on how we see the world and how we, how we react to it. Uh, and that comes back, goes back to the sort of the, the mutual assured destruction thing. There are some Christians who say, "Oh, we ha the Armageddon has to come first. Then there's the then um, there's the millennium with Jesus coming uh, and and ruling the world." 
um, they are the so-called pre-millennialists, um, meaning Jesus comes before the millennium, second coming. Then there are the post-millennialists. They interpret Revelation a bit differently, <clears throat> and they say um, Jesus will come after the millennium. That is, it is our task to create the millennium, millennium meaning and close to uh, heavenly, um, but not heaven, close to heavenly uh, 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 situation on uh, in the world. We've uh, progressed so far that that is pretty much almost heavenly. Um, with but still with uh, a death and pain and all that, but largely reduced. <coughs> um, and then there's also the amillennialists who don't really believe that there will be something like the millennium. Now, North is a post-millennialist and therefore believes in progress. And I, I think he's, he, um, I think having learned that from him about these different kinds of millennialisms, I think that is the main reason why socialism and communism is still so strong. It is Socialism and communism is post-millennialism without God. Um, it's we, we can we can reach the millennium. We can do it on our own. We can we can achieve it. We can achieve heaven on earth. Yeah, and they say heaven on earth because you know and the Christians say only God is in heaven. And we can't create heaven. But if you don't believe in God, then men can and and women can produce heaven. And should, you know, that's the extension of the action axiom. Yeah, we want to improve our situation you know, for everyone then at the end, because we want it for everyone and therefore we must create heaven on earth. But we can't do that, uh, at least that's the Christians. You know, they say we can't do that, we have to do it with God. And I think he's hit on something, Gary North here, uh, that the power, of, but the power, um, not the not the physical power, but the power of the ideology of of socialism. That it's as I said, it's 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 growing after all the atrocities. It's there again, not because. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So there, it's all it's there again because it has such pull, because it's quasi-religious, and that's the religion. It is post-millennialism, without God. Yeah. Thank you very much. I. I I'm sympathetic to um, what you have said mm. uh, to a certain point, and I think it was a very well planned, very structured uh, talk, which uh, I enjoyed, albeit I disagree with uh, a lot of what you said. But that's most, I mean, uh, the most uh, enjoyable talks are the ones that you disagree with. <laughs> um, I, um, they, they are just on, on what you said. I, I think that one of the legacy has been uh, socialism and uh, Marxism mm -hmm. in a very declared way. And, and the structure is exactly the same. In other words, what you, what you described is that history is going somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, it has going towards Parousia. And um, it's, uh, you have a, um, a salvation agent, which is Jesus in Christianity, which is a proletariat. In, uh, Marxism. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, and whereas for many millennialists it is not humanity that is waiting for the return of uh, the Messiah, it is a Messiah that is waiting for humanity to be ready for the Messiah to return. In other words, uh, the humanity, uh, humanity has to be um, has to evolve sufficiently mm -hmm. in order that they identify the Messiah when the Messiah comes. Mm -hmm. And that is very much, as you just said, what Marxism is telling us is that you have to reach that point for revolutions and so on, mm -hmm. where actually there is a second coming, in other words, the end of exploitation mm -hmm. and a <clears throat> kind of paradise uh, in, uh, but on, on, on earth. Mm. Um, a lot of Christians, uh, of course, would say, well, we don't like that sort of violence. Uh, mm. Francisco Fassisi mm. said, um, 
you preach, he told his disciples, preach, preach all the time. Use words if you have to. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not, as you said, just preaching by examples and words. Mm -hmm. It's preaching only by examples. Mm -hmm. Words that's, are already a kind of imposition on others. And, that's that's and Francis. So that's, so, did you say that's Francis of Assisi? Or? Francis, uh, Francis, uh, yeah, Francis yeah. of Assisi, yeah, mm -hmm. the, uh, by the 12th century um, sort of saint. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Sorry, yeah. Yes, exactly. yeah. And um, so there, there is that temptation to. Um, May I disturb you for a moment? Does anybody want to order any food for our kitchen? No, it's your last chance. Um, I, I, I think there is a temptation to um, realize things um, by simply having a blueprint. Because this is how things are done generally. I mean, if you look at a machine, if you look at an architect, if you look at you know, planning, anything and so on, you have a blueprint in your mind, and then you realize it. You mm. make it real. Mm. This is the difference between human beings and animals. Animals mm. don't have that sort of... They just uh, have the instinct to survive. Exactly, that's and right. We want we're, to we're, we conceptualize yeah. something, yeah. and then we realize it. Yeah. And, and of course, if you have political power, uh, then this is what you do. Mm. You, you have something in your mind and so on. I think that looking at all the, I mean, your, your commandments and the you know, Ten Commandments and so on and, and so on, and how this sort of discards the first four, uh, but, uh, and so on. But if you look at the six following ones, there isn't a society that doesn't have them. Mm. Because you cannot conceive as a society that would say, oh, you know, here it's okay to kill. Here, it's perfectly all right to steal. Uh, it goes without saying that you can rape, that can and so on. I mean, that wouldn't function as a society. I mean, people would hide in, in caves, they would disappear, they would and so on. So you have to have these rules. Mm -hmm. What politics does is create exceptions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's not, it's, it's not okay to kill, except Mm. Those people there, you mm. know, they, they, they are the enemies. They, they, there mm. you can kill them. You know? yeah. And it's you don't steal here, except when it is taxes. That, yeah. that, that is perfectly okay, yeah. and so on. Yeah. So you have a ruling class yeah. that creates exceptions for itself. Yeah. And when the except and the exceptions only reinforce yeah. the rule. That is. Um, that is why um, I don't agree with Hopper at that point where he says, well, you know, you don't really need to look at the first four because, um, uh, yes, you're right. These rules somehow exist in all societies, but if you don't have the, the institution of God above even the politicians and the pharaohs, you know, then they will rule forever. And they have the, there is no recourse among the people say look it says that god has said that so i mean the we can't do anything now but it we know it's wrong what they're doing whereas in a society where there's no creator god above everyone you can have these rules to sort of for the plebs so to speak yeah they have to adhere to it um, and there is no recourse when more powerful and better connected and the ruling class do it differently. And uh, I uh, um, would say, I would st say still that is another reason why the West got so strong and free. Because um, I don't agree that w w with what the um, that person from the Open University said that uh, Britain or the West is never a near Christian country. Don't I think, focus. yeah, actually, I think um, there there are there's this the, the, there was a time of this Christian revival in the 18th century. John Wesley, you are, and there was roughly the same time someone else whose name I've forgotten in America. He was from England, Whitfield. Yeah, yeah, that's the name. Yeah, yeah, he was from England. Yeah, okay. Wesley went to America yes. as well. Yeah, and. 
I think that because of those revivals, a there was the American Revolution, which was a which was more of a freedom revolution than the certainly than the French Revolution, and that there was no French Revolution or the French Revolution did not spread to Britain, not just because of the Channel, but because people had a more deeply felt belief in that time and did not fall into the trap of power religion. You know, the French Revolution is an expression, is the expression of power religion and it's still with us, basically. Um, and um, so I, I lost my thread a little bit with yeah, what you're saying. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, not so sure uh, mm. about, uh, about this. Uh, where, I mean, what, what you are trying to say is along the lines of Chesterton, uh, G.K. Uh, uh, Chesterton, mm -hmm. if you don't believe in God, you are ready to believe in anything. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you will believe <laughs> in, 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 in a lot of things. But, um, but then, if you have a society um, that sort of where you have a ruling class that can speak in the name of God, because mm -hmm. that is, that, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you know what God has said? Yeah. And so you have people who come and say, well, God has talked to me, and, yeah. and there is that tradition, and yeah. there is the, you know, the, 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 the scriptures, and all the things that you have to follow. And after all, the Puritans were the ones who enforced with absolute um, rigor, mm. uh, you know, all these commandments and things like that. Mm. But there is not a society that was um, less, uh, uh, more, I mean, less mm. tolerant than, mm. you know, all these Puritan societies and mm. so on. So, mm. I think that the idea of Protestantism was a path towards freedom is, I mean, it stretches a bit, uh, and so on. Mm. Uh, I think that what, what really what you have, I mean, the reason that the West uh, became more prosperous and so on, is not just because of religion or Christianity or something like that, it's a conjunction of things, like all these major events mm. in history, you know, what are the sources of the French Revolution and the mm. sources of whatever, you know, and so on, mm. the fall of the Roman Empire. For the Roman Empire, there are 20 different causes that mm. come together. Mm. And, and in the same way, uh, you know, the West took off uh, because of a conjunction of forces, uh, with religion being one of them, mm. uh, and 20 different others. Mm. Mm. Well, okay. Uh, the question is then which one, how strong are the various factors? Um, with Protestantism, I wouldn't um, discard that so easily. I mean, uh, I, I purposefully mentioned the Rodney Stark with Catholicism because there are very important um, elements of Christianity that were already there in Catholicism that laid the foundations. But as you said just now about yeah, there are some there, there were some people who said that's what God says. So you got to hear the thing about um, Protestantism was um, that they were very keen that pe people would read the Bible and people wanted to learn to read because they wanted to read what the Bible really said. And they very quickly found out that in the situation that Christianity was at the time then, that people were, people in power were telling fibs about what was in the Bible. And that led to the, to, to the Protestant well, I wouldn't call well, yeah, revolution maybe well, we moved back, to move yeah. back to Augustine. I mean, Luther yeah. was basically, yeah. basically an Augustine yeah. monk. Yes. And, but it, it was moved back to an earlier stage of Christianity. Yeah. But, you know, Catholicism itself, uh, I, I brought up as a Catholic, you might guess, I <laughs> um, was a humanism. You know, it, 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 well, in other words, you go through the clergy instead of going through the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's a humanism. Mm -hmm. That's the that's where a humanism began. Now mm -hmm. we consider humanism mm -hmm. to be completely secular. Yeah, yeah. Is, a, a slightly yeah. off topic is one uh, observation I had when I was preparing for this, but um, I thought, that, well, it's not really part of what I'm saying, but I, I will say it now. It's, um, it's interesting for me to see that. Um, it's the Catholic country, predominantly Catholic countries in, in Europe that took on the, sort of the, the Marxism more, more easily and more eagerly than the Protestant 
countries, and it's the Protestant countries that more easily took on the, the cultural Marxism. And it took longer for the Catholics to, or, or, or the Catholics resisted it more than, uh, than the Protestants. Um, I, I don't know what the reason is for that, or if that's a, a, even a valid observation, but that's there, and I'm just throwing it in here to think about I mean, I think the reason why we can't have communism is because of Mises explained the economic calculation argument. But uh, why uh, an idea like communism leads to uh, mass slaughter is a complete puzzle. I mean, mm. there's, there's no way a mass slaughter could uh, further the ideals of socialism or communism. No way a mass slaughter or killing anyone could, could, f could further those ideals. Well, the whole thing is a complete mystery. <laughs> uh, but, but nevertheless, what we do see is empirically, so it you know, turns up again and again under the Bolshevik regimes and the Bolshevism itself. Uh, and Bolshevism, I think, was the first fascism because mm. Lenin started off as a started off as a, a, a Marxist, and then he wrote this book, What Is to Be Done, which is basically going in for a street. Strictly, the the working class can't can't get beyond trade union consciousness. We need a strict we, elite. Now, just a few years l later, another brilliant Marxist, pristine Marxist propagandist, actually adopted the word fascism, Mussolini. Mm. Mussolini was the first rate yeah. Marxist before 1914. Mm -hmm. During the war, he uh, embraced this fascism business. So there's no doubt about it, as my friend yeah. says in his mystery of fascism, which is on the LA webpage. Uh, you know, fascism is a Marxist. It's a, the outcome of disappointed Marxism. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. But why, why all this should lead to anyone being murdered or even anyone being slapped across the face is or even cutting the end of their toenails or cutting the end of their hair I don't know this sort of thing can't further those ideals that's for sure well the end justifies the means kind yeah, of yeah no but the uh, point I, is it don't it's not a means that's my point it, you well, know, there's no way there's no way how any of those savage notions could be a means towards a better world no way at all well, um, um, it, 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 people, it, I've just been reading the Gulag Archipelago, yeah? Yeah. Uh, and the main problem they have uh, unaccountable power. Yeah, once you set the ball rolling, yeah. they're not just a yes, but it's the idea, no, no, it starts but, but off the, with the, the, idea, the idea of communism is the power. <laughs> No, no, it was creating, like, uh, creating it's heaven. Yes, yeah. it was justified. Right it was creating an anarchy on earth. I mean, it, well, yeah, it was creating, creating heaven on earth. And if 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 there's someone you perceive as being against that or being being an obstacle to the path to heaven, obviously that one must be evil, and that justifies getting rid of him. And it justifies t treating him hor yes, horrifically yes, because he's Robert, basically the devil. That is extra to come to the ideals. It's nothing to do with the ideals of communism. Yeah, but um, with, without God, that is then allowed. Yeah. It, it, but the point is, you, see, this is, you keep saying without God, but you see our problem before us is that we don't have the God option. God doesn't exist. Well, that's what you say. It is, <laughs> and isn't it true? I don't believe so. <laughs> well, why do you think God exists? Mm. That's I another little lecture. I, I think yeah. another, another sort of thing here, so yeah. we could end it there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.